It's finally come time for teams to start launching their cars for the brand new 2022 Formula One regulations. And the first team to launch a car is Haas. In this video, we're gonna do a front to back walkthrough of the different aerodynamic devices and choices that they've made on the car and talk a little bit about what the consequences of these could be. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19, and 20 Formula One seasons. And now I work as an aerodynamic consultant, designing race cars across a whole variety of classes all around the world. So let's get into the analysis of the car. There's been a bit of talk about whether this is a livery reveal or a full car reveal. And judging on the statements that Haas have said, they've said that the car that goes to race one is not gonna be super different from what we see here. And based on some of the detailing and the, the design choices that they're showing here, I'm inclined to believe that that is a, a true statement and not just any sort of spin. It does look like this is a likely candidate for their directions on what they'll bring to race one. Obviously they'll have a few tweaks here and there, but they're probably following this as their base platform. Of course, as with any release that may be a render uh, and any release that is prior to testing or race, we always have to, to look at the detailing and think that a lot of that is probably subject to change with release. And we shouldn't be too surprised if we see a number of these details change when they get to the actual car that is racing in race one. Anyway, let's get down into the analysis from front to back. So starting with the front wing, the first thing that caught my eye was the front section in the center, the bit that's slatting the nose. So F1 has presented multiple concepts of the car for this set of rules. Some had uh, the wing going fully into the nose the whole way. Others have had uh, the wing bridging in front of the nose, closer to this. But you'll note that this is a much cleaner implementation. So basically, if you can imagine from side view, is what you've got is you've got a nose coming down like this, comes down and it'll come up something like that. Now, there's gonna be some form of downwash or suction introduced onto the nose. So you'll have some air flowing down like that uh, because we've got suction going on here. We've got pressure on either side of the nose from the front wing. So there'll be some form of air that's trying to go under and curve around this nose like that. So we wanna support that air to an extent uh, to stop it from, from producing too many losses uh, underneath the nose. Uh, or alternatively, what we can do is we can round off the nose a bit more. So obviously the approach that Haas has gone for is to slap the nose. So basically what they've done is they've created an airfoil that goes more or less like that, acts as a little slap for the nose, should help clean up the losses along here and keep the flow nice and attached cleanly around the nose. You could theoretically go for two slats here, but I doubt there would be much of an advantage over a single slat and it would probably be much more difficult to package nicely within the rules. If you have a look at the junctions of the more rearwards elements, they all junction really nicely into the nose and then it's just the front just hangs off it and it's really clean. You can see the little bumps there and there where the, the trailing edge comes up and matches the contour of the nose. That will have really nice support over that section of the nose. So that's quite a nice and clean solution. As we move further outboard, we can see that the, they have elected to just adjust the rearwards element of the flap. So you can see there's, there's two dividers here, one there and one there, and those dividers are where this flap pivots around. Now the rules allow you to adjust either just the rearwards most flap or the two rearwards most flaps. And it looks like Haas has gone for just the rearwards most flap. Now, obviously they think they can get the, the balance range that they need from just adjusting the rearwards element. And if you have a look, what it looks like to me is they might potentially be trying to get advantage of the discontinuity uh, in the flap adjustment section to cast off a little bit of vorticity. So they're probably trying to shed a vortex off along here uh, and another one perhaps along here. These would only be small vortices, but there's not a whole lot you can do in terms of discontinuities in the new uh, front wing regulations. So anything they can do here is sure to help. So we look just to the inboard of the, the front tire. We can see they've got a region that has a relatively sharp increase in curvature along the front wing. And what they're probably trying to do here is shed and build up a little bit of, of sheet vorticity along here that will then, as it comes off the back of the front wing element, roll up into a bit of a little vortex. They can use that vortex to help manage the, the flow downstream in terms of perhaps they're gonna push out uh, the mid wake with it and they're perhaps getting a little bit of downwash onto the mandated deflector with it. Because we can't have discontinuities in this region, we're gonna see a lot of teams try to manipulate the curvature of the wing to achieve their aero intents in this area. If we look further outboards of the end plate, we have a setup where the upper portion kinks outwards like that. Now, 
that, that gives us two different components. One is that we've positioned the shedding edge at the top further outboard that way. Uh, so that should cast any vortices shed off it a little bit further outboard on the tire. And the other thing we've done is that we've essentially cranked the, the tip profile along here because we moved the leading edge outboard. We've essentially increased the angle of attack at the top of the end plate and that will power up the vortex running alongside the tire. So they've obviously managed to, to find performance in shifting the vortex in this outboard manner and perhaps powering it up a little bit. And that can help with managing the outboard wake of the outside of the tire and help a little bit with the upper wheel wake as well. They're probably dragging the upper wheel wake across that way a bit and helping with the overall wake management further downstream. You can see this curvature a little bit better in the top view there where you can see that it, it kinks clearly outwards like that and then is cranked quite hard on the top edge. And also from the rear view where you can see the kink out in that particular direction. A final thing to note on the front wing is that it looks like they've gone pretty much as much up to the legality box as they can. When you look at that front edge, it's bang on the legality box. The rear edge looks like that's pretty much the whole way on the legality box. There's a little bit of a wobble, but that might be because the flap might be in a high position uh, where, where we're at the high end of the adjustment range and you need enough trailing edge space that you can back it off to, to lower balance levels uh, as you drop the flap down and still be within legality. But more or less, they've filled the entire box. And this is perhaps a sign that these cars are, are struggling a little bit for front balance because they obviously don't have their big old barge boards and barge board foot plates, which could get you a lot of, of forward and mid car downforce. And so as a result, they're having to bias that front balance a lot onto the front wing. And that's probably indicated by the fact that they look like they're using the majority of the legality box. Moving back towards the front axle, we have a fairly conventional front setup on the suspension, nothing too trick going on here, but it's worth noting that the brake ducts for the front wheels are very small. Of course, these are subject to change between now and race one or even testing, but it is worth noting that we would expect to see a smaller set of brake ducts these years than the previous monster brake ducts that we've seen. This is because you're no longer allowed to through flow through the tire. So you no longer need to flow a massive amount of mass flow in that brake duct and out through the outside of the tire to help control the wheel wake separation and the upper wake as well. The rules stop this flow from happening. So as a result of that, we don't need as big a scoop because the scoop is only needed to really cool the disc and the caliper, and then it vents out the back on the inboard side. So I would expect across the grid there to be fairly small brake scoops this year. Moving further back to the side pod, I wanna have a brief discussion about this small inlet that everyone's talking about. The inlet does indeed look a little bit smaller to me, but perhaps not as much as people are thinking. When you look at the previous year's car, you can see that it's painted all in black through this region. But when you actually trace out the inlet size, the inlet itself is not that big. On the new car, it's painted in white, so the contrast is very obvious. I'm not saying they're not smaller, I'm just saying it's perhaps not as big a difference as everyone thinks. This is also going to be a bit of an optical illusion because they've got the massively bulbous side pod here. Now the presence of the smaller inlet would indicate that a step has been made uh, on the PU. So it should be a little bit more efficient with a little bit less heat rejection required. And this would allow you to go for a smaller cooling size. If you also decrease the size of the cooling inlet, you can increase the stagnation pressure along this whole area, which can help manage the tire wake. More on that in a second. Let's talk a bit about these big Beluga side pods. You can see that the side pods in this car are really fat. They go the whole way out to legality and then they have a huge flat section just on top of the floor leading edge. Now the logical thing that I think of when I see that is that they're trying to use the stagnation pressure and the outwash from the front of the side pod to help direct the wheel wake out. We don't have more refined devices like, like barge boards, like outer winglets, so we don't have anything in here or anything out here to manage the wheel wake. So we have to use this brute force approach of just having a big side pod. Now, when you look at this in combination with the, the lower floor leading edge fence, the outer one that is obviously at, at legality here, they can only go to 40 degrees out there. You can see they're really focusing on outwashing that tire wake. So they wanna get this tire wake out. That's what was happening on previous year's cars. And so this is a way of doing it when you don't really have much else to control it with. Now, depending on the positioning of their pressure field and all that, it could have either beneficial or detrimental 
uh, wake effects on different parts of the car. So the obvious thing that I thought might be an effect of this is that you'd expect the mid wake to be pushed out a bit, which would give you improved flow quality along the floor edge and to the floor rearwards. However, that could potentially cause a rotation inwards of the upper wake, potentially causing latching on the side pod of the upper wake as it moves downstream. And we could see if it latches a detriment in performance to the, to the rear diffuser, or if it doesn't latch, we could see a detriment in performance to the rear wing. These are somewhat speculative things as I don't have the actual flow field, but it is more or less what I would expect from experience. It's also worth noting that the giant side pod will create a lot of stagnation pressure at the front here. This will help with downwash onto the floor leading edge, which should help with suction around the floor leading edge, which is gonna be something that teams are really gonna be struggling to get because the rules mandate such a high floor leading edge. So any additional downwash they can get on that edge is going to improve front floor performance. The rules allow you to have up to four leading edge strengths, including the outermost one. You can see here in this picture that Haas only has three of them, like that. Now on first glance, you could look at that and say, well, they've only got three, they obviously only saw performance in three. But my speculation is actually that there are four strakes hiding in there. And I think that they're actually using a strake to flap the inboard strake. And if you have a look at this image a little bit more closely, you can see what looks like back here to be the leading edge of a fourth strake. This would lead you with a strake layout like this, where you have an outer fence, which let's call that one strake, and you have the second strake, then you have the third strake, and then the fourth strake there like that. So this could be a flapped arrangement in the strakes that we're seeing here. There is room in the legality box to do it, and there is allowance in the rules for this to happen. So that could be what's very well going on here. A final note on those strakes, is that the outermost strake actually has a little bit of a lip up at the front there. You can see it steps up a little bit like that. And I would hazard a guess that what they're doing with that is they're building a little bit of extra pressure on the outside there, which should help a bit with the wake out wash there. And they're probably also generating a very small vortex off the top edge there, which is gonna wash along the, the floor there and will probably help with a little bit of outwash along the floor, might help a little bit with extracting air and getting a bit of suction along here or it might also help with a little bit of wake management with whatever remnants of the, the lower wake are drifting downstream. These cars are gonna be all about doing what you can about wake management because the rules just don't let you do a huge amount. Looking a bit further down, we can see that we have a fairly conventional curl and flap setup here. Uh, it's more or less what the rules intended. It's not hugely dissimilar to previous year's cars and I don't really think we need to comment much more on that. Going further rearwards again, we can see that what we have is a rather interesting diffuser kick setup where we basically have a two-stage kick. We, we have a, a low point of the floor here and ignore the bodywork illusion of the bodywork coming up over the floor tunnels there, but the kick kind of goes up and up again and it's better illustrated in the top view. Basically, there's a high degree of three-dimensionality to it where you can see that what they're doing is they're expanding around here and they're coming in tight on the bottom and sort of bring the top out there as the bottom bit comes in flat there. Now the rules do require you to come back to somewhat of a sharp corner in this particular region here. So they're always gonna to have to taper back into that, but it's the manner in which they have expanded in this region. Now they're obviously gonna try and get some extra volume forwards to improve suction in this particular region. The more diffuser volume here will equal more suction here, but also they're probably trying to clean up the losses in this fairly sharp corner. So they're trying to make it so the air's got a nice and smooth way to blend into that particular region and a manner that leaves the, the vortices entering the main body of the diffuser quite clean. It's gonna be very interesting to see how different teams manage this particular area. Looking a bit higher at the, the coke line, it's nothing too crazy. It looks fairly similar to what we've seen on previous year's cars. It's a little bit different to what Haas has run in terms of being a bit flattened out through this section, uh, but it's generally speaking following the same philosophy that the cars have for a while, once we're rearwards of the, the giant bulbous side pod, of course, and then we taper inwards to a, a tight bottom section that's, that comes in tighter, and then we have a bigger cooling outlet up higher up. It's worth noting that this cooling outlet at the top is significantly smaller than in previous years. Now, some of that is likely that cooling step that I mentioned earlier that probably allows us to run a, a smaller amount of air ducting because we've made a bit of a step on the PU. But also there's a bit of a change in the rules with respect to, in the previous rules, you had a small venting panel up forwards 
uh, and then you had obviously your big exit at the back. In this rules, we obviously got a smaller exit at the back. It looks like it might go a little bit deeper down to this region where we're not doing a whole lot with the beam wings because the beam wings are fairly flat. But the new rules also allow provision for a much larger venting area further up on the bodywork. And perhaps Haas is gonna run that at some races and this is just a low cooling config and we could expect it to, to become a higher cooling config at certain venues. Let's finally talk a little bit about a few details at the back. Now, I mentioned the beam wing. You'll note that it's a single element beam wing. The rules allow provision for a two element beam wing. Huss has obviously seen performance in going for one. This doesn't hugely surprise me as the rules box does not allow you to crank a dual element beam wing a huge amount. It's not that long and that high a rules box. So chances are that you're, you're probably going to get more power out of a single element beam wing than a dual element beam wing. So this decision doesn't totally surprise me. Looking a bit further up, we can see around the main wing that we have somewhat of a spoon shape. Now the new rules are fairly stringent on how they dictate the, the end plates and the shaping of this region, but it is worth noting that you will see some variant of spoon across the whole grid on the basis of it is somewhat necessary to control the separations in this particular junction here because you have quite a lot of compound curvature. You have an end plate that's cambered out. Uh, and you also have a, a fillet that's going the whole way into the end plate and no real means of controlling any end plate induced separation. So if you had a fully cranked profile along here, you would end up with separation uh, through this whole region here and you end up with quite bad losses and poor wing performance. So I'm not 100% sure on whether or not that's rules mandated thing, but I would expect to see a lot of spoons up and down the grid. Looking a little bit further down at the cake tin, we can see we've got two winglets in the upper area, two upwashing winglets. Now, back in the earlier versions of the rules, this area was somewhat free. I'm unsure if that is still the case. Uh, it was a bit tricky to determine from reading the rules because they are incredibly complex. But if they are free, this is a fairly conventional solution. It's not hugely dissimilar to what was run in previous years. Um, and it's just a, a basic upwashing winglet pair. Looking a bit further down at the diffuser, you can see there is one little interesting detail, which is that it looks like there's a fairly large fillet radius here, tightening into quite a tight fillet radius here. So what they've done is I think that as much as they can within the rules, they've made the diffuser trumpet out of it. So we've got a little bit of lateral and then we've sort of trumpeted it up at the end, probably trying to get a bit of final kick up and out uh, from the diffuser, get that little bit of extra expansion out in all directions and maximize the performance of the diffuser exit. There's only so much they can do within the rules here because there's an exclusion volume within the diffuser itself as well as a limit to where the top of the diffuser can go to. So they only have a limited area to work with and they have radius rules to contend with, but they've probably done what they can here. And that's my initial impressions and analysis of the Haas VF22. That's all for now. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. I'm planning on doing a video release for each car that gets released, so remember to stay tuned for those. Thanks for watching, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.